Hi everyone, I'm Cornelius of Voice Studio East, and this is the fourth installment of the Singing Demystified video series. Last time, we explored how the vocal tract is similar to a swing being pushed by the vibration of the vocal folds. This time, we will explore how the sound in the vocal tract pushes back. But first, a quick review of what we learned last time. The vocal folds work by opening and closing, which periodically interrupts the airstream. This creates sound waves that are reflected at both ends of the vocal tract, the mouth and the larynx, and which can interfere either constructively or destructively with the subsequent wave. To get constructive interference, that is, resonance, we need to shape the vocal tract to match the pitch we are singing. Now, if we remember that sound is pressure, we might arrive at a startling conclusion. The sound in the vocal tract applies pressure on the vocal folds. This pressure is periodic. It swings from high pressure to low pressure, which is to say from pushing the vocal folds outwards to pulling them inwards. Ideally, we want this pressure to be pushing on the vocal folds as they are moving apart and pulling on them as they are coming together. This way, the sound in the vocal tract assists the movement of the vocal folds, constructive interference, instead of hindering them, which would be destructive interference. Let us consider how to achieve this by thinking carefully through what happens in the throat. As the vocal folds close, the air above them continues in its momentum, leading to a drop in pressure above the vocal folds. Ideally, we would want this pressure to be lowest when the vocal folds are closing, not just after they have closed. Conversely, as the vocal folds open, the airstream through the glasses creates a buildup of pressure above the vocal folds. Again, we would ideally want this pressure to be highest when the vocal folds are in the process of opening, not just after they have opened. In both cases, then, the pressure changes are a bit late compared to what is optimal for the vocal folds. This means we want the reflected sound to arrive a bit early, which is slightly suboptimal for interfering constructively with the subsequent sound waves, but far better for interfering constructively with the movement of the vocal folds. And what does it mean for the reflected sound to arrive a bit early? Well, it simply means that we need to tune our resonances slightly higher than the sound pitch. This is what gives rise to that sensation of being confidently on top of the note rather than reaching for the note. Those who have watched the previous video may remember the term phase relationship. Phase relationship refers to how two periodic signals, such as two sounds, are aligned. They can be in phase, or they can be out of phase, meaning offset from one another. Phase relationships are what determine whether you get constructive or destructive interference. When singing, we experience the following trade-off. Because the movement of the vocal folds lags behind the sound they emit, the reflected sound cannot simultaneously be in phase with both. By tuning the resonant frequency slightly higher than the note we are singing, we bring the reflected sound into phase with the vocal folds. Conversely, if the resonant frequency were a bit lower than the note we are singing, the reflected sound would be out of phase with the vocal folds and would actually dampen their vibration. Because we achieve different phase relationships depending on whether we're singing below resonance, at resonance, or above resonance, we can experience discontinuities when the sound pitch crosses a resonant frequency. Here is a clip from Physics Girl who made a video exploring this topic. So the other day, I was holding a tube and I thought to myself, I could find the resonant frequency of this tube by singing into it and sliding up the scale of frequencies like this. Ah, uh, until it resonated. Because physics. But something super weird happened. I don't understand. I was so happy when I saw that you were still doing it. <laughs> 
There were some notes I could not sing, where my voice just cracked. Many singers might find this relatable, especially beginners. Perhaps you run into some strange pitch ceilings that you just can't seem to exceed except by cracking into falsetto. And as you get closer and closer to the pitch ceiling in question, you may find that you have to push more and more. Perhaps this happens more often with certain vowels than others. As you may have guessed, these pitch ceilings have to do with the resonant frequencies of the vocal tract. And because the phase relationships when singing above resonance are more favorable to falsetto than to modal, we may experience voice cracks when trying to sing through them. However, since your vocal tract is fortunately not quite as long as a PVC pipe physics girl was using, its resonant frequencies are going to be both higher in pitch and more sparsely distributed throughout the spectrum. Unfortunately, Discontinuities can also happen from overtones of the song note passing through a resonant frequency, not just the song note itself. For example, if your lowest resonant frequency is at G5, you might find that you experience a voice crack trying to sing past G4. However, because the vocal tract is not a rigid uniform tube, we can actually manipulate its resonant frequencies independently, which is how we form vowels. Hence, we can sing through a resonant frequency without experiencing a voice crack by compensating using another resonant frequency. In practice, the most common example of this is a transition from chest voice to mixed voice, which typically coincides with the octave overtone rising above the first resonant frequency. Since we lose a lot of resonance from this shift, we have to make up for it elsewhere. This can be done either by compensating using the second resonance, tuning it typically to the third harmonic, or by adding twang, which strengthens all the resonant frequencies, but especially the third and fourth. This latter strategy is most suitable for front vowels, whereas the former is more suitable for back vowels. In case that was a bit hard to follow, I will demonstrate. Here is a transition using twang. And here is a transition using second resonance, third harmonic tuning. Oh! Notice how they produce completely different sound qualities. Also, this second approach allows much easier transitions to falsetto than the first. Oh! Here, I am going from yell timbre to whoop timbre, that is, from a first resonance, second harmonic tuning, to a first resonance, first harmonic tuning. However, because this requires the second harmonic to rise above the first resonance, I am bridging the gap by tuning the second resonance to the third harmonic. In addition, because second resonance, third harmonic tuning is a weaker resonance tuning, I am also having to compensate by adding compression, that is, closing the vocal folds more tightly. This is an advanced skill, so don't be discouraged if you can't get it to work right away. Supposing we don't want these acoustic transitions, we can instead stay in a lower acoustic register by opening the mouth, adding twang, raising the larynx, and so on. This will cause the vowel to gradually morph towards a brighter one, either more open or more fronted, according to whether we're tuning the first or the second resonance. If tuning the first, the vowel will gradually open towards R, whereas if we're tuning the second, it will gradually shift towards E. We now have the essential basis for understanding the causes and remedies of straining for high notes, or more exactly, pushing. Seeking to avoid a voice crack and either wanting to stay in a lower acoustic register or just not knowing how to transition to a higher one, some singers will try to simply push a bit closer to the aforementioned pitch ceilings, squeezing the vocal folds together to prevent a voice crack. However, in most circumstances, this does not allow the singer to simply blast past the pitch limit. So to do more than just inch slightly closer to it, they still have to make all the usual modifications adjusting the vowel either towards A or E, depending on the register. 
That is, by pushing, they get themselves about a semitone higher, but they also stabilize the registration so as to prevent a voice crack. Then they make the usual modifications, but now with a lot of extraneous effort. To mitigate this, they can either learn to transition to a higher acoustic register or to simply make the requisite modifications before they start pushing. I have occasionally seen this referred to mainly by classical singers as singing on the resonance or singing on the harmonics, and it is what gives rise to that coveted sensation of being on top of the note. This has been the second episode in a three-part series on resonance. The final part will focus on its practical implications with regard to mixed voice and explain how to avoid a particular type of vocal deterioration. In the meantime, you can check the description for a blog post on resonance. Stay tuned, remember to like and subscribe for more content, and as always, thanks for watching.